This outcome is part of the findings of the research project Spatial Justice in Times of Urban Transition, C2 Transitions. Our research from August 2017 till November 2020 was funded by the UK's Department for International Development through its East Africa Research Fund. In order to understand how complex urban land markets influence spatial justice within the current urban transition in East Africa, we studied four cities in Uganda and Somaliland as and within integrated systems of given political economies. In this video, three members of the project team, Dr. Jami Musijama, Dr. Colin Marks and Professor Michael Walls, discuss key issues in the research and how land markets could be used to make Hargeisa a more equal city in the future. Uh, the International uh, Research Project aimed to understand uh, the relationship between uh, the land markets on one side and spatial justice in the context of urban transition. And in Somaliland, uh, we focused uh, on Hargeisa and Berbera. The project uh, concluded uh, with an in-depth uh, study of selected types uh, of land transactions uh, in order to understand uh, the meaning of the practices uh, for buyers uh, and for sellers of the land. Uh, after, of course, uh, various comprehensive uh, analysis uh, components, uh, including contextual analysis, uh, spatial based on GIS uh, and institutional analysis, uh, supported uh, by representative uh, a household survey in Somaliland, uh, in particular in Hargeisa and, and, and Berbera. So in relation to Hargeisa, what's the classic response to thinking about land markets and planning? The classic way is to think that planning is there to support the maximization of land values. And in order to do that, land needs to be thought about as a commodity. So that's one, one way. The other way is that um, planning is there to correct for market failures. And land markets are notorious for generating market failures. Um, it, they lead to a lack of provision of public services and amenities and public spaces because um, individuals have no interest in providing for that. They typically um, create environmental problems because no one's thinking beyond their immediate parcel of land as to what kind of environmental effect they're having. And um, through practices like speculation, they can lead to land being taken out of use for many years and people then profiting from that. So planning is there to try and stop those practices happening. Okay, so that's the classic version. That's the classic version. What we're proposing is somewhere a little less classic than that. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're thinking about land markets in a different way. Um, and um, in Hargeisa and in Barbara, where we did the research, there's certainly evidence to show that the social trust and the social relations that make the land market work mean that planning needs to have a very different relationship to land markets in order to produce a sustainable future for Hargeisa. What are, what are land markets doing in Hargeisa? So I think whatever um, perspective you take on land markets, whether it's the classic one or whether it's maybe one of the variations we prefer, really the answer is kind of similar in the sense that it's about resource allocation, the resource of course being land. So land markets are the dominant way of allocating land both in terms of the uses of that land, and that's definitely very much the classic perspective. Uh, so uses such as what um, bits of land are used for public facilities, or schools, hospitals, clinics, police stations, and so on. What's used for housing, what's used for businesses, what's used for industry, and so on. So there's that use-based allocation of resources. There's also the important um, subsection of that, which is from a planning point of view, it's very important to understand how uh, the proximity of different uses might affect the people that are using the land in that area. So for example, a highly polluting industry next to a school has particular social implications and physical health implications for people attending that school. So very important in those terms. We would also put a lot of emphasis on the 
um, aspect of land markets as allocation of a the resource of land to people um, and the way that that impacts on the social shape of the, the city. Because mm. that, that's also important in terms of property rights. Yes, very much so. Um, I think in, we might see it in terms of property rights then becomes a, a part of the argument about how we um, affect, can affect, um, the nature of the availability of land to people to use in the way. Of course, people have different aims, ambitions, resources um, that they would like to use land to achieve. Um, and property rights are an important part of the equation in terms of shaping what they can do with that, that land. In other words, how much control they have over the land, over what period of time. Do they have just the, the, the use rights to it? Is it a tenure situation? Do they own it? If they own it, do they own it in perpetuity or is it for a period of time? Those kinds of things directly derive from the, the property rights regime. And in Hargeisa, there are a range of different property rights. There are. And in some ways that can become quite confusing because there's a what's often referred to as a tripartite legal system where you have Sharia law on one hand, you have a customary system on the other, and you have a judicial legislative system um, also playing there. And that, in a lot of places, um, small villages or rural areas particularly, the, it's, a, it's a little bit clearer in the sense that customary systems tend to, tend to still function still dominate. In a city like Hargeisa, which is being the commercial center of Somaliland, being the, the political capital, it means that you have a much more, a much greater diversity of people coming to the city from different backgrounds, with different social status, different economic uh, situations, where the uh, tripartite system becomes a bit more difficult to operate on. So yeah, the issue of property rights then, then does become more complicated and has given rise to a significant level of conflict over over who owns what land, who has the right to use it, whether that um, whether the sale of land is, was was justified socially, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, taking together what the land market is doing is shaping the current form of Hargeisa, very much so in terms of who's getting land, where, and what they're doing with it. Yeah, um, it's shaping the social form yeah. in, uh, in terms of which groups or type, which groups of people are uh, landing up in which parts of the city. And most importantly, it's shaping the very much, and most importantly, it's very much shaping the future of the city. Yeah. It's putting in place the physical structure that will take Hargeisa into the next hundred years or so. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's important to remember that a lot of the things that shape all those um, aspects shape the way that the land markets function. Uh, you know, as I was just saying before about the sort of tripartite legal system, a lot of the, the things that shape the way the land market works are invisible. They're um, cultural habits, cultural relationships, which determine more than price even in a lot of cases, where people can buy land, whether they can buy land, um, how much they pay for it. Uh, and what they can do do with it. So you get these these quite I think complicated social um, norms um, that significantly affect land markets and consequently the the shape of the city for generations to come. Mm. So this is an important theme that we need to come back to these social forms and social norms that re yeah. interrelate with the land market. But I think one thing which uh, would be interesting to think about now is. What would happen if we don't reconsider the relationship between land markets and planning? If we allowed um, land markets to just operate as they are now? Um, at the moment, Hargeisa is a fairly equal city. Um, what do you think would happen if we, if, we, if we just let land markets run as they're doing now? Um, it's a really good question. And I... I think we're seeing a lot of what would happen. It's already happening. Uh, you get, first of all, land values become increasingly unequal. Hargeis is interesting because the, the social structure of Somali society means that it, 
there are, there are no slums in the classical sense, or very few. And those that there are are peop- displaced people that have come to the city without the social um, the integration that, that others have. Most of the city, what you get is you get neighbourhoods that have all levels of, of sort of social um, privilege or unpri- you know, lack of privilege. Um, in, a, in one way, that's really fascinating. Um, you get a city that's quite diverse, um, and planners and a lot of cities have worked very hard to try and keep create that kind of diversity within neighbourhoods so you don't get ghettoisation. Um, but on the other hand, also happening in, within neighbourhoods is that you get increasing inequality. So you said before, some, Hargeisa is a relatively equal city, and it still is in relative terms compared to most cities in the world, but it is becoming less equal and it's becoming less equal quite fast. And because you have this particular land use form, this, this sort of um, pattern of land use with the, what I mentioned before about the, the sort of compound building and so on, that enables that increase in inequality um, because it means people are very much literally able to stake out their space and, and embellish it as much as they want, whether it's business or, or home. Um, so you get that increasing inequality of land values it becomes very, very difficult to retrofit infrastructure. Um, so you get the uh, sort of rapid growth, relatively unregulated, um, driven by market forces, but really those market forces are not very good. One of the classic areas of market failure, to go back to the classic thinking, they're not very good at putting in place public infrastructure. So roads are ter- in terrible condition. Street lighting is, is mostly non-existent unless the neighbourhood themselves will pay for it. Um, so, and, re- and installing that in retrospect is very, very difficult and much more expensive than if you plan infrastructure into the process. There are also significant deficiencies in terms of the availability of space for culture, for public space, for some of the, the basic functions of education and health, because they're all such, so market-driven in terms of the allocation of land for those purposes. I don't know, I mean, you've been there. What, what, was, what were your um, observations about the way land use has been affected and will be affected by such an unregulated system? I think one of the things that I observed was a, a, a lot of fragmentation of the activities. Uh, and if land markets continue to operate as they do, that fragmentation is likely to grow and that's likely to impose costs on the city in terms of its economic growth and then um, the benefit of how the city works for everybody. So left to run as they are, I think land markets are going to cause problems for Hargeisa in ways that they haven't up until now. So up until now, they've been running relatively efficiently and, and working pretty well for people. Most people seem to find land in the city very easily, our research found. But increasingly, I think there are going to be problems that emerge. What, what types of transactions did the research find in Hargeisa? So we found basically three types of transaction on land. One was transaction which was then formalised, registered. Um, so through the system making sure that tax was paid and so on. The second was land transactions that didn't involve the full registration process, um, often meaning tax wasn't paid. And the third was tra- land transactions for space that... Um, where the transaction occurred through a rental arrangement. Um, from your point of view, from what you saw in the research, what do you feel were the implications of that sort of system, those three types of transaction? Well, I think the first one, where people are registering with the municipality, the research was suggesting that not all the tax was being recovered by the municipality, which then weakens the resource base of the municipality to engage in effective planning. In the second case, where the transactions are not registered with the municipality at all, is an even worse example of that. So what that is doing is reinforcing the situation where um, a municipality that's lacking planning capacity is not getting the resources while the city's growing and has even greater planning demands. Um, And then the third type of transaction around rental, I think, is pretty much off the radar screen of um, planning as it is. Um, 
so taken together you, there's there is not a positive feedback between the land administration system and planning at the moment and that is meaning that planning is going to become effectively weaker and weaker and weaker both because they're not getting the, the financial capacity from the taxes and also the information exactly. to, to plan effectively. Yeah, in order to plan effectively you need to know who owns what, where and what they're going to do with it. Mm. That would be the backbone of a good land administration system. So can you give some examples of how that manifests itself? Well, the lack of resources would mean that local government and the planning department would be understaffed and would lack the resources and the capacity to do anything. Um, another example would be that uh, the municipality can't plan ahead, um, which just exacerbates the, the situation. Um, so that really means, there's a bit of a classic situation I think in a lot of places where People don't trust the local government because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything because it doesn't have the capacity to do it. And because it doesn't do anything, they're not willing to pay taxes, so therefore it'll never get the capacity. So quite a vicious circle. Yes, and so what people do rely on is the social trust. And Hargesa shows high levels of social trust amongst um, people who are transacting in the land market. And uh, an effective system, which is operating outside or irrespective of that municipal system but as we're saying that's likely to have problems or create further problems cumul and even cumulative problems going ahead okay so underpinning all this is basically the, the position that the land market itself is not functioning in a way that's either in, in some ways economically efficient in the sense that you get long travel times and things like that but also socially efficient um, that because of this lack of planning ability, infrastructure is not provided well, public space is not available, there are significant impacts on, on the, um, the social functioning of the, of the city. Inequality increases rap um, rapidly at the moment. Yes. And rather than call for the classic response of saying, well, planning needs to have a rather hands-off relationship with the land market, we're suggesting that it we think about that relationship in a slightly different way in order to support that those social functions. So why do you think planning hasn't been an issue up until now? I think that's an interesting question. You've got a sort of almost a um, chicken and egg kind of situation where in a lot of ways the fact that there is a high level of social trust and that that underpins the functioning of the land market means that people haven't been forced in a, into a situation where they've needed to engage with the planning system. They haven't be, felt compelled to pay tax. Um, so you could say that in some ways the, the level of social trust actually allows land markets to continue to function the way they are without the regulatory and planning la layers. You could also flip it around and say that it's because of the lack of planning that the social trust has emerged in the way it has um, and has taken the place of, of a lot of the more formalised systems of planning and regulation. Um, I think in some degree both of those are probably a little bit true. The one reinforces the other. But I think social trust is probably the answer to the question you just asked. That's why the planning system hasn't been um, compelled to be more more effective. And, that, and that's what we're saying now, that that relationship needs to change because we're starting to see that planning yeah. has definitely a role to play in ensuring the sustainable future of Hargeisa. Exactly. So, yeah, Hargeisa is changing. Hargeisa is easily the most cosmopolitan city in Somaliland. It has the greatest demand on um, land prices, on land markets, and I think we can confidently predict that in the future there is going to be a greater and greater need to, to make a transition or to reinforce the regulatory system because the, the customary systems are going to break down because they rely on the, the homogeneity of, of communities to a, to a degree which is not going to be there in the future. And what we're needing to think about then is that relationship between planning and land markets, not in a conventional sense, but in, in a way where planning comes in to 
to work with that social trust to make a, to make Hargeisa sustainable in the future. Yes. So how would you go about making planning work better in Hargeisa? I think one of the things to avoid would be to fall back on the classic way of planning, thinking that it needs to zone particular areas of the city, homogenizing land uses. Um, clearly, the vibrancy, the growth, the future of Hargeisa lies in its diversity. So there's a, a light role for planning to play in making sure that the noxious industries don't land up next to the schools, as we said before. But I think that planning needs to be thought of in a slightly different way. One where um, it's supporting the, those social relations that are currently uh, working through the land market. What about infrastructure? You need planning to, to make sure that infrastructure is put in place, don't you? Yeah, so that would be a, an important thing, an important element that planning should focus on. That provision of infrastructure, putting it in place um, up front, because as we said before, it gets very expensive when you try and retrofit it. Um, but also very sensitively, because one of the key issues that affect land value is proximity to infrastructure. And we know that the infrastructure is very unequally distributed in the city at the moment. So planning, I think, has a key role to think about in terms of how it's shaping the distribution and the implementation and the provision of infrastructure for a sustainable Hargeisa. Okay, and what about um, wealth or income inequality? Does planning have a role in terms of maybe poorer people's ability to access the city or how can it affect those, those relations? Yeah, so we, I think we saw that intricate um, diversity of neighbourhoods in Hargeisa and the conventional way in which planning has tried to deal with that is to provide um, for different sizes of land in different parts of the city. In other words, in allowing poorer people to buy smaller pieces of land and thereby, part thereby participate in the land market. But that's not ha that doesn't seem to work, or well, the land market doesn't work like that in Hargeisa. So that approach where um, planning needs to enforce different kinds of, or different sizes of land parcels, um, can be we can go beyond that. We can think of different ways where um, perhaps the key issue is not so much um, regulating that, but allowing for a much higher mix of different land parcels in each area. In Somaliland, we were partnering with the Institute for Research, Heritage Preservation and Development, which is part of Red Sea Cultural Foundation, the Hargeza Cultural Centre. Uh, and Dr. Jama Musa Jama is going to tell us a little bit about what the project entailed, what we were seeking to do, and how we collected data. Now, the major contribution, in my view, uh, of the research uh, uh, was to build uh, the Special Justice Index, uh, and in particular, for uh, the city of Hargeisa, it highlighted some uh, few key points that I would like to share. That, uh, for example, authorities uh, cannot uh, guide uh, the growth of the city and they are failing, for instance, uh, to preserve uh, public spaces uh, for the city. And that uh, it's essential to review the process uh, and the support uh, that the uh, local government got uh, to plan better for rapid expansion and for unplanned urbanization that's taking place in many parts of Africa and in particular in uh, Hargeisa. That, uh, number two, the land uh, market transactions are more commercial, including from uh, the Rutani diaspora. And this is uh, certainly a problem. Uh, uh, there is a certainly a problem to get room for an instance, uh, for the basis access uh, to the land uh, property for the ordinary residential uh, access. Uh, number three, that uh, rural migrants are more vulnerable and the climate change is showing uh, its consequences uh, through the drought uh, refugees that are uh, coming in mass uh, to the cities and in particular in the capital, Hargeisa. 
Number four, that uh, the city could accommodate better and well the number of its today's inhabitants uh, with access to the basic uh, land uh, for residential. But unfortunately, there is uh, extensive uh, land speculation uh, to the periphery and up to, the, to 20 kilometers from the city center. Uh, that, as a number five, uh, that there is a need for a review of uh, formal procedures and policies uh, also to access the land, uh, also to improve uh, the revenue collection of the local authorities, uh, so to be also able to provide uh, the needed services that uh, the uh, local government is providing now. And finally, that the land conflict sometimes arises due to the uh, disputes over the land uh, and over the transactions. Uh, so therefore, there is a need of a comprehensive review of the management uh, and the capacitating of the local government uh, uh, would prevent a kind of a conflict uh, and it would maintain uh, the, the stability. These are, with additional elements, uh, some of the elements uh, that we hope uh, uh, to be benefited by policy makers. Uh, and as we are in the dissemination phase uh, of, the out of, the, uh, of the output of the research, uh, we hope that uh, this message is coming to the local, uh, uh, local in Somaliland, in particular in Hargeisa, decision makers. Uh. Finally, for us as an institution, being in part of this consortium of uh, uh, institutions uh, had an important meaning as well. It showed us uh, how best to work between researchers uh, in institutions or research institutions uh, in the north uh, and uh, in the south globe uh, and, 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 and can make, uh, if we work together, a meaningful collaboration in terms of research. Uh, for instance, uh, junior researchers uh, who started to engage with this uh, uh, project uh, in their first steps of doing impactful research uh, from our institution are today pursuing uh, their uh, further studies uh, in the best research institutions uh, in the UK with full, with full scholarship that they get it outside of this project, which means uh, that this kind of collaboration can produce uh, also another way of benefiting for each, from each other. That's what I would say now about the project.